Hey y'all, what's up? My name is Jess. Welcome back to my garden here at Roots and Refuge Farm. We are growing our own food here in Central Arkansas Zone 7B using natural growing practices and sharing it with you guys here on our YouTube channel. I post weekly garden tours on Saturdays. If you're new here, uh, welcome. If you are not new here, welcome back. We are really getting into the time of year that it's just the full swing of the growing season. We're starting to harvest a lot of stuff. Uh, all of our growing here is done for personal use only. We do share with like friends and family and you know give some stuff away but we're not marketing or selling or anything like that. Uh, that sometimes like boggles people's minds when they see just how much we're growing but we have a big family and our goal is to be able to preserve food and provide our family's needs for the year. And so that, that takes a lot. So let's jump into this tour and take a look at these gardens. I'll be completely honest and tell you that there are a lot of things that are needing attention, specifically in this garden. We are remodeling our kitchen and it's completely torn out right now, which means that, uh, you know, we're doing that whole shuffle of grilling and cooking with temporary measures and it's just really difficult. And because of that, I've been primarily doing the gardening stuff on my own. Usually I have some help and I don't right now. And that's okay. So you get to see some weeds today. Those do happen here, definitely. So we still have our bees over here in the cottage garden area. That is going to change. We're gonna be moving those. We just haven't yet. And when we do, we'll finish filling this back area out with like some beds and stuff. But we knew when we started this, it was going to take a little while to see it fully through. So my hydrangeas, my limelight hydrangeas are starting to get their first blooms. This right here is just like a volunteer ground cherry that came up because a lot of this compost is from our farm. So it had seeds in it from stuff we grew that went through our animals and into their bedding that happens. I'm just gonna take a real quick look here in the cottage garden. I feel like not a whole lot has changed here. Maybe it's just cause I see it every day. But I've just been sowing new seeds here and there. They're sprouting, there's more sprouts. And I think this space is gonna continue to be really beautiful and just fill out. These are really interesting. This is the Dara Wild Flowering Carrot. These seeds came from Baker Creek. I never planted them before because I just didn't know where to put them. And I put them in here and they're just a really interesting plant. Obviously it's a carrot variety, but it's not one that you grow for the root. They're just grown for the flowers. Carrot blossoms are really, really pretty. I'm excited to have those in here. I've got zinnias coming up and looking lovely. Here I've got some chamomile that I just kind of threw in here as an afterthought and I'm going to harvest these. They're kind of starting to get to the point of needing to be harvested and I'm gonna harvest these and dry them. I, I'll dry all our chamomile for tea that we grow. I think probably my favorite part of the cottage garden right now is this herb spiral. I it just, it's so pretty now that it's filled out. It's just gonna get more full. I also just love how fast things fill out. Like this tricolor sage was just a tiny little start that I got at a local nursery. Look how large it already is. This thyme is gonna spill over the edges. Here I've got some dill, which this is going to go in with the cucumbers that I'm gonna be showing you guys here in just a little bit. We have quite a lot of cucumbers coming up and it's time to start making some pickles. This is something that we actually have stopped on in the garden tours recently and I've had a few people ask me about it after the garden tours. This is my asparagus bed. Now we just, started establishing this this year. I'll tell you, asparagus is one of those things that whenever you read about it and you read the fact that it takes three years from planting to be able to harvest it, it's easy to say, oh, what a, you know, like that's not gonna be worth my time and to put it off and to not plant it or to not make a space for it. But we moved to our house six years ago and I did that exact same thing over asparagus. Well, I don't know where I'd put it and oh, that just takes so long. I wanna plant something that I can actually harvest right now. And I really wish I hadn't done that. I really wish that I had just established an asparagus bed then because I would have then been harvesting asparagus for the past three years, but that's always how it is. Hindsight's 2020. We finally went ahead and put this in this year. Actually, after I read uh, Barbara Kingsolver's book, Eat 
uh, animal vegetable miracle and she talks about how she has established asparagus beds everywhere she's ever lived like even in rentals and stuff like that because it's like her way of believing in the future of growing food and it just really moved my heart so asparagus this is what it looks like after it grows up Here's a tiny little spear coming up. And of course they're puny little things because they're they're brand new, but eventually these will be nice big fat spears uh, that look like what you would get at a store. And what you eat when you're eating asparagus is you're eating that little sprout the first day or two that it shoots up out of the ground. And then eventually it opens up into these lovely ferny looking plants. And you gotta give them about three years to get fully established before you start harvesting from them and every year you can harvest those sprouts and then eventually you let some of them go so the plants can grow aren't these zinnias cheery i actually have this spot right here that's open and i brought these seeds down here to throw in right here and just add some more zinnias these are the moulin rouge cutting zinnias and i just want to fill this spot up because i think the red will be really pretty next to these and also i thought i'd like to have some more cutting zinnias to be able to put flowers in the house when i plant zinnias like this when i want them to look like this i want them to be nice and filled out but still tall with like healthy sized plants the thing is with plants like this if you plant them really close together like you'll still get flowers but the plants be won't be able to grow as large and so for me putting them about 10 inches apart on the seeds provides plants that look like this and they branch out you end up getting a lot of flowers they fill out but that's how i fill up a patch so whenever if you've watched my past tours if you see like a big patch of zinnias that's usually like six seeds it's not very many Now, when we watch these red zinnias grow in future tours, you will have a little bit of a grid of how long this takes because you uh, saw those planted. All right, back to the raised bed garden. You will see how empty this bed is. It's because we just harvested all the garlic and onions out. And then here, I've got carrots and they are going to be harvested out. I've been trying to hold them off till my kitchen was functional again because I just wanted to can them. Bless him, Lord. I don't remember planting a potato vine in this bed. You did. Remember we put it in that bed, but then we moved it over there because we put the jasmine there. It's taken over. Yeah, it is. So basically that potato vine is a honey badger. It just does what it wants. <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> Thank you. Coffee drinks. <laughs> you look so majestic with the sun behind you bringing me coffee through the door. Maya fertilized these roses the other day and they just started blooming like crazy again. That's pretty awesome. I mean, that's a lot of blooms considering they had none on them. We've been using this rose fertilizer from Stark Brothers and that's all we've used this year and it seems to work really well. Uh, I have another bag of a different kind that I'm gonna use as well and see if it, if it works too. But that Stark Brothers stuff has been really, really good. And he went and fertilized all the roses uh, the other day. I think we've got 18 different rose bushes, different areas of the farm and a, that one started blooming again. All right, back to the veggies and now I have coffee, which makes it even better. So here are the noodle beans. Kind of interesting. If you see this side, how far it's reached up versus this side, which is just making its way up. This side obviously doesn't get as much sun because it's right behind this sign. And this is the difference that that makes. If you are growing in a shady area or a shady lot and you feel discouraged that your plants are growing slower, that's why it's because, uh, you know, when they have sun, they grow faster. My garden is primarily, it's a full sun garden. Basically to be considered full sun, a spot has to get six to eight hours of sun a day. The back side of my garden is partially shaded because in the late afternoon, these trees block the sun. And that can actually be a benefit it, having some shade is not a bad thing as you can see here it really does make a difference having a lot of sun so I've been harvesting noodle beans here's some little babies here they're doing well I'm so close to having my kitchen functional and I promise I'm gonna be showing you guys recipes that's one of the things you've asked for a lot is recipes especially and things like noodle beans that you might not otherwise know how to cook and I will be sharing those things as soon as I can. I think the big milestone this week has been the influx of cucumbers. I mean, we're just harvesting them so much. Here's more. I just harvested a bunch. 
off of these plants the other day. And we'll spend probably like three good weeks just being bombarded by cucumber harvest. Here I've got another plant here. That behind is actually also a cucumber. That one hasn't started yet. That's Armenian white right here. It takes a little bit longer to get started because it's technically a melon, not a cucumber. But so far we're, we're just getting a whole lot. These are volunteer melons and I'm very conflicted because I'm pretty sure that these are chrysanthemum melons. That's what was growing on this trellis last year. And I really, really loved those and I want to keep these and I don't really want them growing here. So I may just see if I can move them down. They might not be chrysanthemum melons, but I hope they are. This year in the spring, because of COVID and everything, all the seed companies were so overwhelmed and so many people were buying seeds and I just decided not to buy any seeds. I just wasn't gonna order any because I already had so many and I had plenty of things to plant. But there were just a few things that I would have liked to plant that I did not because I didn't have seeds for and chrysanthemum melons were one of them. So I was really hoping maybe I got a little, a little gift of volunteer melons. Maybe, maybe that's what they are. These are melons which I need to work back up onto the trellis here. This early stage of getting things on your trellises is really the, the, the hardest. Once you get them fully established to go up instead of over like this, they will climb. They put off these little tendrils. I would really love some input. When you watch this video and you see what all we have, I've got these bare spaces where I took the onions and garlic out, where I took this out, and I really would just like to know what you guys think I should plant. I'm open to be experimental, to try new things. I totally am good with that. This is, this is okra down the side, and then this is empty now. Here's my corn. This bed's a little bit weedy, but you can see the corn coming up. This is that blue sweet corn from Hudson Valley Seed Company. Now, there was a little bit of conversation that happened when I talked about wanting to plant a few different kinds of corn. And I've done some research, and this is one of those things that I'm finding really conflicting stuff about. So I'm gonna have to kinda, kinda do some experimenting and learn for myself, but basically, there is a rumor, um, I'm gonna call it that, or a belief, I guess I should say, that if you plant more than one kind of corn, the corn growing on those plants won't be right. And I'm, I'm not 100% sure that that's true. Now, I know that corn will absolutely very, very readily cross-pollinate, and it cross-pollinates on the wind. So if you have any other variety of corn growing within like 500 yards, I think, of your corn, it can become cross-pollinated by it. That's one of the reasons why the whole GMO issue and cross-pollination with GMO corns has been such a problem because small farmers can't save the seed of their corn because it can become cross-pollinated. However, I don't know that it's true that like if I grow a sweet corn next to a popcorn, that the sweet corn will grow bad corn because it's next to the popcorn. I would think just, and I could be wrong on this, and this is something that's like very debated. Like many people are like, no, you just can't save seeds from it. And many people are like, no, it'll produce bad corn. And it makes sense to me because I know there's a there's a debate with peppers. Like a lot of people say, don't grow your hot peppers next to your sweet peppers because your sweet peppers will be hot. Well, the first year, your sweet peppers will not be hot. They'll grow sweet peppers. But if you save the seeds from those, they will always be hot if they cross pollinate with a hot pepper because hot genetics override sweet genetics. And I would think that that would be the case with the corn, that this sweet corn, even if I grew popcorn near it and it cross pollinated, this would still produce sweet corn. But if I saved the those seeds it would produce um, a Frankenstein corn that wouldn't be worth anything so I don't I don't know it's not gonna be an issue for me really this year because basically what you can do is stagger planting and plant like I've got this sweet corn it only tassels for like two weeks so it can only cross pollinate for the short little window of time and I'm gonna grow popcorn in another one of these spaces uh, but I'm just starting it a little later benefits of a long growing season I can do that but i would i would love some input on that if you've got anything to say about that particular issue i just it's one of those things whenever you read people adamantly stating something and they're completely contradicting each other it makes my brain explode like i i 
I don't know what to do with that. That's whenever I end up just like trying it and seeing because I just need to see for myself in those situations. So many people have been tagging me in photos of their Kajari melons that are setting fruit and here I am without that. My kale bed is still coming along here. Uh, still harvesting from it, but it's starting to struggle. Probably be tearing this out here before too long. I'm just going to let it ride as long as it will produce for me. Because kale is something that if I'm not growing it, I end up buying it at the store. And I like not having to do that. Now this is kind of interesting. I tried this and I really don't think that they're going to do anything. These down here, this, this, and this. These are called, goodness, now I can't remember what they're called. They're an F1 hybrid. And they're like, they're kaolettes or something like that. And essentially it's like a mix between a Brussels sprout and kale. Now Brussels sprouts grow down in like the armpits of the stalk. And you can see they're starting to produce something. But they look like little flowery, uh, frilly Brussels sprouts with kind of kale -y leaves. And I was really excited to try them, but I really think I planted them the wrong time of year. Brussels sprouts take a long time. They're like a 120 day crop or something like that. And for us, even if I plant those in December, like I started these seeds in December, they're not gonna be coming to fruition until it's really hot. And <clears throat> I really wanna master Brussels sprouts because that's Maya's like favorite vegetable and I've never successfully grown them. I think what I probably need to do is start those seeds in about July inside under the grow lights and then move them into my high tunnel in the fall and then grow them through the winter in the high tunnel. I think I'll be able to successfully grow Brussels sprouts that way. These back on this back side are collard greens, which I love. Oh, and this is finally done enough for me to show you guys. So this is a frilly kale, a blue curled scotch kale that went to seed. It shot up its little sprouts and it had flowers and it put these little pods off. And I've just left it here to be able to show you guys how to save seeds from this. Okay, so here's one of the little pods from that kale plant. And this is really very simple. Uh, you open this up and there you have kale seeds. Uh, once they're completely dried out like this, they get nice and crispy and they're super simple to just peel right open. And what I'll typically do when I'm trying to save seeds with something like this is get a little Ziploc baggie or envelope or something and open these and just dump them directly into the baggie because they're really small seeds, as you can see. So if you have a kale plant that is going to seed or something similar, something of the like, I've got some lettuce that I'm waiting to save seeds for over there. And um, I ha actually have some carrots that are going to seed that I planted in January. And you really, you don't have to like let a whole bed go to seed. Like that one plant has probably 200 of these pods on it. And each of these pods has probably like 30 or 40 seeds in it. So. As you can see, that's a lot. Uh, the only thing I would think that you would need to even, like I, I'll typically just let one plant go. Like I saved of that whole bed, I saved that one plant that went to seed and tore the rest of them out because I can get enough seeds from that one plant to, I mean, plant as much kale as I want. But you could save a few plants worth if you were wanting to do like microgreens. One of the things with microgreens is that uh, you know, seeds can add up whenever you're doing microgreens. That's probably one of the most expensive parts about doing them. And microgreens are really expensive to buy because of the fact that they are, they use so much seed to grow. Um, but if you could save your seeds from kale like that, you could let six plants go to seed and save all the seeds and probably grow several batches of microgreens. So it's kind of an interesting thing. Uh, saving seeds is a lot easier than people make it out to be, to be completely honest. You can read all the books and watch the videos and the guides and all that's really good. It's good to have the information, but just a baseline rule. If it's not obvious where to get the seeds from a plant yet, just wait a little longer. At some point, it's going to become really obvious. At some point, it's going to grow into a point of maturity that it starts producing seed. Like fruit, I mean, obviously the seeds are in the fruit, but for vegetables, uh, if you can't see the seeds yet, just wait, you'll see them eventually. <laughs> <laughs> Just give it some more time. <laughs> Let's take a quick look at these beds. They are filling out really nicely. Very funny, my clematis here that now has some shade on the roots. You guys told me to give it shade, but this sunflower is casting shade. This one is just taking off. I've got squash coming up here. They'll finish shading those roots. More chamomile. It's just everywhere. I've plugged this in anywhere that I could, so it's growing all over. 
dahlias. This catnip on the end has blossomed. I've cut this back multiple times. This is this plant's second year. It's a part of the mint family. Mint is very uh, frost hardy, so it did not die back through the winter and it just exploded in the spring. But now that it's blossomed, it is just constantly covered in pollinators and really just a beautiful plant to have here. Noodle beans, been harvesting these. These are taken off. Look at my sunflowers. They grow inches every day. Literally, they, they actually grow over an inch every single day because they're growing. I think this one probably has grown two feet in the last week. Pretty cool. We also have the Kakuzi gourds, which have gone wild. They're clinging all over the sunflowers, going all over the place. And they were covered in blossoms earlier this week, which now the blossoms are closed up because they're about to set their fruits. So this little wild mess here is probably one of my favorite spots in the garden right now. It's so beautiful. The zinnias. Here's another example. This, this little patch of zinnias, which is just starting to open and fill out. This is probably like six seeds or so. You can kind of see the different colors of plants. Very, very beautiful. This is the Northern Lights blend of zinnias. Uh, however, some of them, like that red one, might have volunteered here. It is the time of year where it gets so hot so early. <laughs> Oh, I'm just sitting down for a second. So there are some things out here in the garden that, like I said with the carrots, like I, ideally I probably would have harvested those like two weeks ago, but we had just torn out the kitchen. And my hope was, okay, well, let me just see if they'll hold off until I can more easily do something with them. I'm gonna have a lot of preserving to do as soon as I can. I mean, I've just been getting by with what I'm able to do right now. Um, one thing that I'm also hoping will hold off is my beets. I've got a handful in this bed, I've got a handful over there. Um, and my friend Jill over at Whispering Willow Farm, which she's been on my vlog multiple times, she posted a video the other day about preserving beets, which I'm going to uh, put a link to down below so you guys can check that out. It's a really short video And my hope is to dehydrate those um, and then possibly pickle some of them uh, But that's one of those things that I'm like, can you just wait just a few more days beets? <laughs> Here the cucamelons are gearing up. They've actually started taking over this trellis next to them and I'm just gonna let it go and see what happens. Uh, we've started harvesting them though. My kids have been primarily eating all of the ones that come off of here But like, there's a little one these make really cute pickles. Um, I've never canned them before because they don't, they don't hold up well to like cooking. They're, they're just so small and frail. But I'll just do quick fridge pickles with them and they're super cute on like a charcuterie board. They're really just cute. They're just kind of novel. But they're also good. They're, um, they're best when you harvest them when they first get to full size. If you leave them on the vine longer, they just get more sour, which you may like that. But I like them when they're first to the right size, like right now. And they are wild things. They just take over everywhere. They take a little while to get started. So if you've planted these and you're feeling discouraged, just give them some time. They're really slow at getting started. But once they take off, they're, they just go crazy. Here I've got holy basil and then behind it, more cutting sunflowers to have more for my house. And then here are the beets I was telling you about this whole side. These got a slow start months ago. I think I direct sowed these in February. Actually, I had my nephew here, Ryan, and he helped me sow these. And they were overshadowed by some kale that was next to them and they just didn't grow well. So I, when I pulled the kale out, I fertilized these and they've really taken off. They're just about the right size now. But like I said, I'm trying to hold out to have my kitchen. Here's something I know you guys are gonna be super excited about. Check that out, guys. Those are some almost ripe cherry tomatoes. The other day on this plant, which I'm pretty sure this is the sun gold. This was one of the plants that the tag got buried by my dear sweet helper child. Remembering what all I planted, I think the only solid uh, yellow that I planted like this was a sun gold. Benjamin swiped the first ripe one the other day and Malia saw the next ripe one and she's laid claim to it. So I'm just patiently waiting over here. Uh, 
mom life, right? And that really excites me. Here's the thing, whenever you're really anxiously waiting for something in your garden to start producing and then you get like the first one and then the first two and the first three and they're like these coveted few, what that says to me is you're about to be covered up. You're about to be in the full harvest. Just hold on a little while longer. In a week and a half, I'm gonna be harvesting handfuls at a time. In a month, I'm gonna be harvesting bucketfuls at a time. So seeing those, I can wait. Um, I'm, I'm excited. I wanna eat some, but I can wait because I'm about to have my fill. These beds down here are slightly shameful. <laughs> they are really not very well cared for. Um, I've been caring for the tomatoes, but the beds themselves, I just never got around to planting a whole lot in these. I've stuck some seeds in here. Some things didn't germinate well because we had all that rain. And I think a lot of stuff got washed away. So I need to come out here with some persistence and get this fully planted and get it going. My tomatoes out here look pretty good. They look very typical for what my plants have usually looked like by the mid to end of June, which is to say I've got some big fruit that's still very green, nothing getting too close to ready. Um, my plants are starting to get pretty tall back here. Specifically, some varieties are looking really good. This is a plant that accidentally got topped, so it's sad looking. Uh, starting to deal with some pests, particularly aphids, which I've been doing some reading and learning about what causes those at a root level and learning that that is usually caused by excess nitrogen. Now that may end up being my first ripe larger tomato. That looks like it's starting to change color just a little bit. That's a variety called Floridade, Floridad, which is uh, really suited to hot weather. One thing I'm really starting to see happening back here is like very sick bottom leaves. I've been having to prune off a lot on the lower parts of my tomatoes because I'm just seeing yellowing and spots, which is really typical for me for outside tomatoes. And I'm actually really glad that I still planted tomatoes outside. Whenever we decided to put the greenhouse in, I kind of debated because I knew I was going to put so many tomato plants back there and I thought, well, maybe I should just plant all of them back there. And I'm really glad that I didn't this year because I'm getting to see a comparison of how much of a difference it's really making to be able to keep the moisture off of them and solely bottom water them because my greenhouse tomatoes are pristine. Like they're seriously completely perfect. Uh, they're so healthy. I'm not dealing with pests much, probably because I have such healthy plants. Um, and I really solely put that on the fact that I've been able to keep the moisture off of them. I'll show you when I get back there. I'm also taking a lot of precautions to keep them really healthy. Like I purchased a separate set of pruners to just, they stay back there, making sure there's not cross contamination, making sure if I'm working on these and I'm washing my hands before I go back there and really trying to keep that environment place that I can have really healthy plants. I've never successfully grown tomatoes in August before. I've never had plants last till August because of the humidity, even with all the precautions. Uh, yeah, I mean, I might have some stragglers that are hanging on and picking a few tomatoes here and there, but I've never had like still been harvesting much in August. And I have hope with that greenhouse that it's gonna change this year. Here's a really beautiful, that's a striped German. There's some more big ones. All these are striped Germans that are have big old fruits. Hey, handsome boys. <laughs> this is the first week that I've really started harvesting okra very much. Harvested about 10 pods off of here the other day which was you know, substantial enough to actually be able to eat more than just one or two raw in the garden. But these are going to get so tall. If you're watching this video, I don't know, three months from now, there will probably be an updated garden tour where you can see these plants five or six feet tall. They become really massive. So getting 10 okra pods off of this entire row is definitely an early harvest before too long. I'll be getting baskets at a time. The squash still cranking it out. Um, I shared a little bit of this harvest yesterday, um, starting to harvest the spaghetti squash. And this whole area is just getting really wild. The sweet potatoes here going all over the place. You can see more squash I'm just rambling back there. Back here is my Jerusalem artichoke bed, sunchokes. Sunchokes have really pretty flowers that are sort of reminiscent of sunflowers. They aren't quite there yet. I think some of them are kind of starting 
to look like they're producing their first buds. But I'm excited about that. I won't be harvesting those till a good deal later. I harvested um, a little over 100 pounds of potatoes out of these two rows earlier this week. I have one row left. They have not really started dying back a ton yet. They've just barely begun. So I think I've got a little bit of time and I'm sort of putting it off because of the space issue because all of the potatoes that I harvested here have just taken up all the space that I have for storage. We're gonna have to build a shelf or a rack or something to keep them on and then we'll pull these out. But as you can see, I mean, they still are very green. The plants really start dying back when they're ready to come out. I walked back this way to show you guys this. So this is just, this grows wild all over my property. Here, check that out. Well, watermelon. These are the Sunburst Hybrid Squash. It's my first time to ever grow a hybrid squash. And they, I can't keep up with them. They are producing so much. And over here, I've got some more little baby watermelons. These are called like a, I can't remember, Rainbow Sherbert variety that was from Mary's Organic Seeds. These are sugar babies. So these aren't gonna be real big melons. We have grown watermelons before. We've never grown a ton of them, but I definitely planted more this year, hoping to end up with a lot. Uh, there is a family near here that sets up a stand and sells homegrown watermelons. We end up buying several from them every year. Watermelon is one of my, my favorite summer foods. I love watermelon. I'm really excited to see those growing. I just checked my lovely video records. Uh, to make sure I was telling you right, but this entire space here was planted from seed 55 days ago. As you can see, it's doing well. This entire row here is squash. The other row are melons, and in between are some field peas. The only issue we were having here was that some of the weeds were growing up on the side, which we've mulched the sides now so that these have a space to ramble without it being in high grass but they're starting to set a lot of fruits. Now all these are winter squash. There's like a butternut. Here's a sweet meat. Back here are some pumpkins, some uh, New England sugar pie pumpkins. And then all of these cutting sunflowers, which look really beautiful. This right here makes me want to just grow an entire field of sunflowers. I don't have a field, <laughs> but if I ever do. <laughs> I love sunflowers. Definitely a favorite. They're so cheerful and happy and they grow so well. The only thing with growing all of these along the ground in this big tangled mess is going to be making sure to keep an eye on what's growing so we get to them when they're ripe. Like there's a little little baby melon right there. The bees are all over the bees. Actually had a third row here and I never ended up planting anything in the middle and now it's completely covered with these plants, so it is what it is. I think we can probably expect these runners of these melons to like make their way all the way over here. It's gonna be pretty wild. Last stop, the high tunnel. Oh Lord, I thought that was a snake for a second. All right, so I made a mess in here. You can see the ground. I was pruning yesterday and I didn't pick up my mess. Oh well, now I'm busted. Now this first bed are my hybrids. These are the Jet Stars and they are setting quite a lot of fruit and looking really good. Now notice the health of these plants, which have been cared for just the same. The only real difference is the fact that these have not had moisture on their foliage. They have not been rained on, which makes a pretty massive difference. The other thing that has been really surprising to me is that this whole uh, high tunnel, all the plants in here were planted about a week and a half, some of them two weeks after those plants in the front garden. And as you can see, they're so much taller. Also, I just attest that to not struggling with super bright sun because these are covered with a shade cloth. So whereas it's been 95 degrees outside and the other plants may be struggling with that, these have, a, have plenty of sun, but a little bit more of a protected uh, experience with that. And then also just not being rained on and therefore staying healthy. So you see the sprayers here. I've got one here and one down there. My daughter Malia was out here with me yesterday helping me spray. What I've been spraying on my plants this year is a product that was recommended to me 
by Brad Gates from Wild Boar Farms called Pure Crop One. And it's an organic product. And the way that it works is that it's not like an organic pesticide that you see pests and then spray this on. It's something that you spray on your plants from the beginning to help them build um, just a stronger immune system. And so I've been putting it on. I've tried to do it weekly. There have been some times that that was delayed a few days just because I wasn't able to get to it. I am noticing definitely that aphid problem and just some pest problems up in the front. Yesterday, I noticed whenever I was working in here, I found a couple of really tiny, tiny hornworms that just happened to be on branches that I pulled off. So it's probably time to get the black light out here and start looking for those. But otherwise, I haven't had any pests back here. So I don't know if it's that product is just working that well or if it's just all of the circumstances coming together to make these plants so healthy. But I'm pretty amazed, like I really am amazed at how well these are doing. My peppers as well. These are all jalapenos right here and they're setting lots of fruit. Uh, the eggplants on this side, not doing quite as hot. These got pretty riddled by some flea beetles, but I think that they'll pull through. My eggplants on the other side are massive. We're starting to really see some fruit set on the tomatoes. Here are ground cherries which we planted these earlier than those, and these are obviously just taken off. Here are more peppers, and back here are our onions, which we laid out to let them dry a little bit. There are moments in these garden tours that I really just wish you guys could take a big whiff and smell what I'm smelling. <laughs> this is one of them. It smells so good in here. Seriously, just, it smells like life and tomatoes. I wish I could bottle that. Now you can see here, I've pruned pretty heavily the lower branches of these plants, um, leaving where there's fruit, but pruning off anything excess just to keep that airflow good. Uh, the other thing is that there's shade cloth. This is like a 40% shade cloth. So I don't have to be so concerned about sun scald, which would be the problem outside because these are going to be protected from that. I did make one observation I'm kind of curious about. So these are some of Wild Boar Farms, uh, Blue Beauties and Black Beauties, these two rows. And you can see all these baby fruits here. They look very green. So if you're growing a plant that's high in anthocyanins, uh, meaning that it has purple on its skin, that's how that shows up. Like Wild Boar Farms Black Beauty Tomato is one, uh, Dragon Tongue Bush Beans, Blue Gold Berries. There are several different things, uh, not just tomatoes, but they, they have a lot of anthocyanins. Now there are some things like carrots, obviously. Uh, those roots are purple. If they're full of anthocyanins, they're purple either way. But when it comes to things like tomatoes and beans and stuff, anthocyanins are really brought out and exaggerated by the sun. So if you've got, like, I remember one year I had a branch of a blueberry tomato plant, and those are the ones that get that purpling on the shoulder. And the branch had kind of fallen over, and so this cluster of fruit had been turned upright towards the sun. And the, bear, the tomatoes on that cluster were completely 100% purple because the entire fruit had been pointed towards the sun. And I was noticing, I have a couple of black beauty plants in the front garden. I put them up there as a control just to see how they did, which one did better here or there. And those fruits are very purple already. The black beauty and blue beauty fruits in the high tunnel are not purple at all uh, because of the fact that it has that shade cloth. So they're getting a filtered sunlight. And I'm really curious how purple these will get in this circumstance. Uh, that may be a variety that in the future I don't grow in the high tunnel. I, they'll still taste amazing, they'll still be good tomatoes, but I really do like that deep purple skin and so I'm, that may be a variety that I reserve for outside growing. And then save the inside space for varieties that are different. Now this whole bed is climbing triple crop. Climbing triple crop is an heirloom that was developed I believe in the 50s or 60s for high tunnel growing. There are now, you know, in 2020, we actually have heirlooms that were developed, you know, by the Heinz company, by the Campbell Soup company. Um, they're the more recent heirlooms, but they're over 50 years old. They've been handed down for multiple generations, so they're considered heirlooms. And climbing triple crop is one that was developed for growing in high tunnels. And so it's one that vines really long 
I love this tomato. It has great flavor and the biggest tomatoes I've ever harvested have been climbing triple crops. They, I've harvested two pound fruits from these. They're beautiful, they're tasty. The plants um, are lovely. They're potato leaves as you can see here. they have got these massive leaves. They get really, really sick out in our humid and wet climate. And I've loved growing them but they are usually one of the first varieties that has so much blight and yellow spot that I've got to tear it out pretty early. This would be one from just based on what I'm seeing so far. Uh, this is one because it was developed to grow in this kind of uh, conditions. This is one that I will probably exclusively grow in here. I did put a couple of these out in the front garden also as a control just to see if it really made that big of a difference. But I can tell you that in years past, towards the end of June, my climbing triple crop plants are usually really starting to struggle. And these don't have a single sign of issue. And I'm so thankful. And they look completely perfect. Now let's look at this last row over here. There's a bumblebee in here. The peppers are really large, really beautiful. So, so happy to see this. I'm just so glad. Um, I, I really wanted to have a good pepper year this year and it looks like we're going to. I pulled all the early fruits off of them, but now they're setting flowers and little fruits that I'm leaving. But I wanted them to really uh, settle in well with a good root system. And down here, I've got a few eggplants that just Oh, hi little frog, you scared me. Look at that little buddy. Now these eggplants had a little bit of flea beetle damage too. You can kind of see the holes, but they've largely recovered. And usually what'll happen, if you have pests messing with plants when they're young, uh, they may do some damage to them when they're young, but if they can pull through the damage, typically what'll happen is they'll get big enough that they're not bothered. And like with these eggplants, now you notice the other ones at the other side, those were planted at the same time. Uh, these are getting more sun. Again, there's an example and they're different varieties too. Now that doesn't make a massive difference. Uh, I think if those eggplants on the other side were planted in this big, they would be a lot bigger, but the variety does matter a little bit. With these though, you can see this damage that's on them, but the fact that they're still really big, healthy plants, these are gonna produce a lot. They're gonna get really big, and they might still kind of struggle with flea beetles a little bit, but it's not going to kill them. And a lot of times what happens with your plants is if they might struggle in their early days with some pest pressure, but once they get big and strong and their immune system is big and strong, uh, they, they pull through and that's not an issue even, anymore. Now, so far I have not put any sort of support for these peppers, but they are going to need support. Normally what I do is just stick a stake down next to them and just tie them to that, but I have a lot of pepper plants this year. I'm not sure, I might not do it that way. What I may do is some sort of like T-post and then weaving some twine or something throughout them to hold them up that way. I'm not sure yet. I, I haven't had to figure it out yet, so I, I don't really know. Even though I worked out here for two hours yesterday, I'm still seeing branches that really need to be tied up. That's how it goes. Well guys, that about wraps up all of our gardens for today. I shared yesterday a harvest video where I did quite a bit of harvesting. I didn't see just a ton that needed to be harvested today, maybe a few things, but again, I don't really have a lot of places to put them. That should change by the, by the end of this week, we'll be back into a place of having more functional spaces in our house. So I'm, I'm working on the format for these videos. I really wanna be able to share all of it with you guys, uh, but obviously it's gonna have to be broken up. So I think that what I'm gonna be doing as well as tours where there will be touring and, and talking about different things and some harvesting, I'm also going to be doing just harvesting videos as well to be able to share that uh, in a way that I'm not posting documentary documentary length videos daily <laughs> because that would be a lot. But I do so appreciate you guys hanging out with me. I love getting to share this with you. Your enthusiasm, your questions, your input, your tips uh, have completely enriched my garden and my life and I so thank you. I cannot say it enough. Thank you for hanging out with me today. I bless you. Until next time.